Okay, hello, happy Saturday, everyone. I hope everyone is doing very well on this blended day. Today, we have Mary Ann with us who is going to present on secure coding. I'm very excited and looking forward to this presentation. I just want to say thank you to our sponsors as well. And she's going to take it away and I will sign off. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Diana Initiative. And we'll be talking about do your developers write super secure coding? The presentation will be discussing projects and secure coding through all the phases of the software development life cycle. And are your developers writing super secure coding? And we'll be discussing all the tools they need to be super. Topics discussed will be secure coding guidelines, best practices, secure coding standards, and checklists, and how to use them throughout the, the Agile team meetings, as well as secure coding trainings and certifications. Now, we all probably know what these terms mean, secure coding guidelines, best practices, and so forth, but not all of our development teams actually use them or actually know what they mean. So let's go ahead and go through these and make sure that we know as secure coding practi practitioners actually know what they mean as well. My bio. I'm actually a senior cyber engineer too, and I've been at Raytheon for over 30 years. I've actually been a, a cyber engineer for about 10 of those years. I was a software engineer for 20 of them. I have a master's in cybersecurity and two certs in secure coding. I work with uh, programs and help them with the SCA process and SCA tools and help them to analyze their issues. And that's why I'm giving this this demonstration or this discussion on tools and secure coding because I've kind of found a problem with some of our programs that say, hey, we're going to do this, but I'm not seeing it being done. And so even though their requirements say they are, they don't always do it. And so I have to kind of help a lot. So let's start out with the design phase and how to use guidelines. So most programs could create their own coding guidelines. And if you're going to create your own coding guidelines for projects, it will really depend on the type of organization that you are. And it will also depend on the type of software you develop or the languages that you use. And that will depend really on or why, because it depends on how complex or if you have to use specific securities or how's your safety. And so coding guidelines are very, very specific to if it's safety, if it's HIPAA, if it's PII. So things related to coding guidelines are for like, coding style, understandability, and readability. But if you have things for languages and so forth related to those as well, eh, it's going to get a little bit more hairy. But coding guidelines can also make it so that your code is your code may be too difficult to understand. So a secure coding guideline can make it more easy and all of your code could be similar in readability. And once you have your coding reviews, if everybody's code is designed the same way, it would make it easier to have your code reviews. If your code is well documented and you have a developer leave, the next person who picks up your code, that would make it easier for a new developer or another developer to pick it up and be able to fix something. If your code is not documented well, well, you understand. I mean, I've got programs that have been around for 20 years. Luckily, I've got developers who've also been around 20 years. So in that case, it's a little bit easier to fix that code. But when the, some of those developers leave, some of these newer de newer developers are going to have problems if that code is not well documented. Also, having functions that are way too large. Oh, my Lord. You have to talk about spaghetti code. I've seen some of those. 
And unfortunately, I also had the, some of those legacy programs that they did not want to fix that code. But if you, I really wanted to fix some of it and because I found errors and they said, nope, fix that one line. And I finally left a program because I couldn't handle some of the code that I found. It's like, all of this needs to be fixed. Nope, fix that one line. I finally left that program and left to, went to another one because I couldn't handle that. Um, and go to statements. Trying to debug a program when you have a failure in a code that has go to, that is just problems. Do try not to use go to statements. That should be in your guidelines. Try not to use go tos. Then we go to another guideline. Um, advantages of using guidelines is your code if you have increased efficiency um, because everyone is doing the same way so your your reviews are faster you have less development time because all of your code is being done the same way your reviews are going to be faster and you may find errors quicker because everyone is developing the same way so uh, another way to do it is using best practices and making using rules to make your best practices better, but also using um, coding standards. And there are many coding standards that can be used as well that can help you in your design phase. Some of the best practices that can be used for your design phase would be commenting and documentation. Um, making sure that you actually comment and document, but a lot of code uh, in my static code analysis, trying to figure out sometimes some of these errors that I come across, code that is doesn't even have a header. And it's like, what the heck does this file do? Is it even their code? Is it somebody else's code what what does this code do there's no documentation no commenting no nothing i don't even know what this variable does you really need to have some kind of documentation in a function some kind of something but there's some programs that just have nothing that is a best practice people you really need it and it makes it easier when you have problems or even for new people, like I said, to pick something up. Consistent indentation. If you have code that has multiple indentations, sometimes even a static code analysis will tell you, hey, this is an indented right. And you go to look at it, it will actually I've got some that is indented completely off and it'll you'll have an if else that is completely not right. And I'm going, they just, it's because they indented it wrong and it was just really off. And so making sure that consistently indenting, make sure that people are using always in your program, using always using spaces or always using tabs. Oh, I know, I know. Everybody wants to use one or the other, but as long as you're consistent, that's the way to go. Um, I know some people always want to use tabs. It's cleaner, but some people always want to use spaces. Consistent namings. There's still people that want to always put an I before an integer. They always want to put an S before a string. As long as you have a consistent naming scheme and make sure your names are not 30 characters long. I mean, come on, people. I'm still finding some like that in some of the code I'm reviewing. That's just really overkill. And avoid deep nesting. Again, some of those if-else statements that, I'm sorry, I'm not doing their code reviews. I'm just doing the SCAs. But I'm finding some of those and avoid the deep nesting. Those that that kind of code could actually be simplified. I'm sure there has to be a way to make that simplified and 
there has to be a way because usually that means that you just keep adding cases as you've gone down and oh we found another we found another we found another there's there's got to be a way limit line length limit the line length to 80 characters you go to try to print a print your file i'm sorry i'm old school um when i would go to review something i go print it and then i would check it but if something is over 80 characters in length like i've seen some and it starts wrapping try to look at that code and you try to debug something like that especially some of the c sharp code i've been looking at lately okay um yeah that gets kind of hairy so make sure that your line length is not because you've just compressed all of your commands onto one line. And then capitalizing SQL statements. Now that's good common practice. That's so that you can, that jumps out at you. That's a SQL command. You know that because SQL commands are, are capitalized. Avoiding magic numbers. Don't just assign a magic number. Don't assign a number to something and don't and without commenting on it. If you've got a comment as associated with a number assigned to a variable, at least that will tell someone when you leave the company that this number is assigned because of its it was assigned because of this reason. Because if for some reason that number needs to change, at least they know why it was assigned in the first place. If it's just assigned and nobody knows why and it fails for some reason down the road, hey, we need to change that number now. Why was it assigned in the first place? Nobody knows. Well, if there was a comment associated with it, they would know why it was assigned in the first place. So... If there's a reason for assigning other than just initialization for zero or true, false, something like that, that's, that's avoiding. Avoid magic numbers. Always validate your input for any kind of external data sources. Again, just a normal common best practice. Any input coming into your your code should always be validated. It, whether it's input strings, characters, you know, make sure that your your numerics, anything coming in, if even if it's network values, um, something coming in as path data, make sure that it's size wise. Everything is in, is validated. People don't just say, "Oh, it's." It's coming in from our, our software. We know it's it's valid. No, always validate your input because you don't know. Someone might have put something in from another source. Error handling and logging. Ugh, that's been one of our biggest things this weekend, I think, is logging and some error. I've heard some error handling. But a lot, of, a lot of the code that I've been seeing lately is also a lot of error handling is missing. And so make sure that your code is catching errors. A lot of programs that have been around for years, all of a sudden static code analysis is catching errors. Really? I thought errors never going to happen. Oh, but it could. So put an error handler in there to catch it. Otherwise, your code could crash. And what happens if it could? Oh, that could go down? Not a very good thing. Why don't you put the error handler in just in case? Use the compiler's highest warning level. Okay. Now, maybe you don't want to do that because, okay, you're going to all of a sudden start getting warnings that you never got before. But what are you using now? Are you using the lowest warning level? I could almost guarantee you that most of our developers are probably trying to use the lowest one they can. But I don't know. Check, check with your developers. Check to see what their warning levels are set to. 
deny access by default. Yeah, that's one of those that's like, um, what do, what do people say? Do you check the conditions, you know? Do you always allow access? Do you always exclude? You know, what, what should your code do? You know, it depends on the, the code. What, what, what is, it depends what the code's supposed to do. So that one is kind of one of those that, you know, that's where the best practice is. Okay, your code has to do one or the other, but deny access by default, that's one of those that's like, oh, okay. It says always deny access by default. Yes, that's supposed to be the case. Another best practice is using a style guide formatter, a beautifier, and a style checker. And those actually would make your code beautified, makes everything pretty and lined up, indented. That's okay as long as you don't have legacy code. Thousands, hundreds of thousands of lines of code like I do. I don't think I want to run something like this against some of ours because I'm not sure what this would break. But if you've got new code, something running something like this against your uh, against new code to make everybody's code the same, this is a great idea because you know this would make it so that everybody's is the same, and it would make it so that everything is following a standard format. These are some example style guide checkers, the beautifiers, the formatters. There's, you know, different languages. Um, there's some for every language you can think of. Everything from Python to C to C++, um, VB, Java, um, there's linters, everything in here. Now, like I said, at my site, we don't use any of these because a lot of our code is legacy. So we don't use these. But these were actually given to me by another, sor another source. So they say that these are great. So, and, and recommended that they, that to use these. For instance, this is great code. This would work. But in case of looking at code that looks like this, oh no, this is, I'm sorry. If I saw a code that looked like this, I would throw that person and no, I, I would throw them out of class if, if they were in a class that I had because this is not well formatted code. I'm sorry. Now that's a good good one for like a, a for a, a formatter or a beautifier that would then make it nice and pretty and well formatted. And if there was a problem with the code, would be found very easily because this you could find it and a static code analysis tool would make it much easier to find. Sorry, it hit, went off the page. <laughs> I couldn't put it all on one page and make it readable. So now we're getting to standards. Secure coding standards are used to prevent introduction of security vulnerabilities. Okay, we all understand security vulnerabilities, or at least we should. So, examples, one example of a security standard is the SCI certs. Um, down here at the bottom of the page is a link to the SCI uh, website where you can actually download two downloadable books, the um, coding standard for C and C++. I have both of those printed out at my desk because I am C and C++ uh, coding standard 
certified professional. I actually completed that cert. That is one of the, the secure coding certification that I do have. I also have the White Hat certified secure coding professional certification. Um, but uh, actually at that site, they also have the SEI coding standards for Android, Java, Perl. Um, but that site actually shows you all of the standards from, from SEI for all of these. And they explain each of the different, throughout each of these languages, um, the standards and how to make sure that a vulnerability would not get into your code, um, how to write good secure code. Now, it is a little difficult for a um, new developer maybe to understand, and that is probably why someone who, who is unfamiliar with C and C++ maybe to try to get um, one of these professional certs, but um, we did have some of our more advanced developers follow the just the regular C and C++ SEI training. They came in and gave the boot camp in our building. So um, you can actually um, take the class and get the regular regular C and C++ training as well. I have that link at the end of this. Um, Another coding standard is the NVD coding standards. Now these um, are the National Vulnerability Database and it contains links to perform analysis on the common vulnerabilities and exposure, CVEs, and associate CVEs to <laughs> CVSSs, CWEs, and CPEs. Now, this, this database or this standard um, is a link to a whole bunch of different associated um, standards and vulnerabilities. And it's, it can tell you a lot of different vulnerabilities and um, it, it can tell you how things all interconnect and how one weakness can link to another and how one platform can link to one other vulnerability and so forth. So trying to use this by itself is not a complete, but it is part of your process. Then we go to the CVE website. Um, the CVE website is where the common vul vulnerabilities and exposure, the CVEs, can actually give you a list of the vulnerabilities and give you examples of fixes in many languages. And this is a site that in my job, I've actually pointed several of our developers to how to fix some of their issues because it actually, we use Coverity in, our jo in, my, in my job and um, as a static code analysis tool. And it does have a link to CVEs and for those developers who are newer to some of the languages and may not understand how to fix something, if um, they may not want to come, they don't feel comfortable coming to either myself or one of my associates, um, I have pointed them to the CVE database and said, and there are some examples um, on that database. And if that doesn't help you, still come to me and we can talk through and we can act I can actually maybe show you how to fix it. Um, and so we've we've actually 
gone through the CVE database and found some examples on how to fix some of the some of the issues for some of the problems we've had. Okay, um, the other way to do it is actually having programs or projects create a, their own secure coding standard. Um, at the end of my presentation, I have a link to um, a project-specific secure coding standard document. It's a dot .doc that I found, um, and it links you to whether you're going to use SEI, whether you're just going to use CWE, whether you're going to um, use uh, style checkers, whether you're going to do this, whether you're going to do that. Um, if you're going to include high risks, if you're going to do specific things. And it actually was, I thought, a very well thought out document. And um, like I said, I've got a link to that document at the end of my spreadsheet if anyone is actually interested in it. Um, it, it is at the end of my doc at the end of my document. Okay, um, for for reviews, when you get to um, code reviews for secure code reviews, um, if you do agile processes, sp sprint planning, uh, sprint reviews, do you include secure coding reviews? such as manual code reviews or automated code reviews? And do you track them? track the, this information in a tool like Azure. A manual code review. Now, don't get all up in arms at me. When I say manual code review in this case, it's not what a lot of security people think as a manual code review. A manual code review in this case is not going through all the code and finding every flaw that can be found at this time and every link that could be evaluated. A manual code in this time frame means just reviewing the code that was changed at this time. Um, for instance, um, this is doing a manual code when you don't have, say, Azure set up. You're not doing an automated when you're using T Jenkins or Azure, TFS Azure. And so this is a little bit different than a normal manual code review. And you're thinking of a security review. This is this is a true code review. I'm going back to my old days here. Um, so who should attend these type of reviews? Someone with definitely someone with domain experience. You need someone that understands when someone made a change to this code, did this code change actually do any damage? Um, so someone with domain experience should really should always check these reviews. So someone higher up, like a, um, a, a tech lead or someone, someone like a tech lead should always attend these. A, the, a junior developer should always probably attend these and have your security personnel should start should, should should probably attend these as well um and then have code review checklists um the code review checklists we'll discuss in a little bit but um if you use a code review checklist we'll discuss why to use a code review checklist but um this this process is going to make it a little bit easier. So doing a manual code review, if you do manual code reviews, you find logic errors and flaws where you might find them in the design and the architecture, and you um, you find you add room um, that it, it, you have room for extra set of experienced eyes. You don't have just a um, automated person, an automated code checking it. You have experienced people checking it. Plus, you have a security person in there. You have AppSec knowledge. You have people that, like us, reviewing it. The cons 
Okay, you have to have somebody, like I said, you have to have a security person, but you also need somebody that is experienced with language and frameworks in there. So um, you, you have a little bit of a con in there. And then if you're not using the checklist, you're going to get different reports. So that's why I say you might want to use a checklist because otherwise it's not going to come, you're not going to have the same reviews. So what should your checklist be? Um, if you're going to use a checklist for a program, probably should be language neutral because I don't know about you, but a lot of my programs use multiple languages. I've got some that go VB, C, C++, C Sharp, .NET, all on the same program. So if they're going to have a checklist, it's probably going to be really language neutral. Have a plan of approach to approve code changes. Uh, make sure that you always know it's only going to be this amount of time. It's going to include um, this certain amount of things. Um, don't over don't overdo it, people. Just always include certain amount of of topics. Um, sections for a checklist include things like exception handling, um, auditing and logging. I mean, you guys can all read all of these, but you know, make sure that you're you're verifying that if you're in these sections, or it need or or a section should have these. Maybe you should say, hey, in the future, maybe we should add these. I mean, I know if you're only adding uh, one line, you don't want to go in and say, hey, you needed to add this. No, we don't always want to add code. Just because, hey, there wasn't an exception handler, you needed to add it. Because we all know that if you add too much code, you're going to break something. But you might want to add a new CR to say, hey, in the future, you might want to add an exception handler to this section and get it reviewed at a later date. So other things like a general um, libraries, make sure your libraries are up to date. Yeah. Um, sensitive data hasn't been identified. OK, that's something your security person is going to have to make sure. Layered security, okay. That one's a little bit harder unless your security person is familiar with the design. Some of these cryptography, input validation, okay. Yeah, some of these are, are you checking for special characters? Validating numeric input. We, we like we talked about earlier, input restricted to known characters. We talked about that earlier, Ver checking your inputs, authorization. Um, some of these, are you actually checking? Are, do you have things where you have a URL, where you actually have session cookies? Do you have ACLs where you actually have to authenticate? So now we're going to an automated code review. So automated code reviews, you can use full code coverage or nearly. I, I know not all SCAs can do full code coverage, but I have uh, like my co coverity. I, some of my coverity can do almost full code. Not I've got some that don't go all the way, but you can use tools like coverity and fortify and run it during an automated build. and best time to do most of the time is is when you're doing the build development and run nightly or when you're adding I have some that run nightly because they add code all the time and then I have some that only run when they add code to their um, SCM some and that's because they add code so un infrequently that they don't need to run nightly they may add code once every other week. So Coverity, just an ex as an example, for those that aren't familiar, Coverity, you know, as an SCA tool, helps find 
security and quality issues and can be used to track um, across the application and, be, and it can mute with cyber and security working together can be used to fix find and fix issues that are found and it supports 21 languages looks similar to this with the dashboard being on the side and then the code in the middle and then the triage window on the right side Fortify, we have had some programs trying to use Fortify. Haven't really had much luck getting too much out of it yet. But you can get a prioritized result. Again, with the, by severity of risk, you can um, fix vulnerabilities with cyber and software working together. And it supports 26 languages. It's uh, usage looks like something like this the um, cover there are some desktop static analysis tools which coverity is one and then desktop or developers can run it from their desktops while um, doing their development and that way they can actually find issues while they're actually doing their development and if they actually inject issues they can actually fix them before they actually get sent up to the desktop or excuse me sent up to the web server and that way you don't actually inject issues all the way up if you fix them in, earlier in the pipe in the the chain and so if you fit if you find er, them earlier you don't you inject fewer issues and find you can actually fix um, issues earlier but you can also fix maybe some that as you're working on code if you see that there's an issue related to what you're working on, say you are working on a line of code and there's a coverity issue related to that, you can actually fix something related to that at the same time and fix multiple coverity issues at the same time. So it's we're, we've got um, a, one program that's actually doing that right now and they're, they're injecting less issues and fixing more at the, fixing multiple issues. So it's, it's actually working fairly well. So um, the pros for doing an automated code review is it, it detects and it may detect uh, low-hanging fruit and it, it may find a lot of vulnerabilities. Um, but I, it says that there may be a lot of, of false positives but I truly have not found a lot of false positives um, not in a lot of our code um, you can test quickly and have large 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 chunks of code it's very important to do it in an agile environment um, to be able to test over and over and over and if you can do something like static code analysis and be able to do it in an automated environment and this is this is really the way to go is to be able to have the to be able to run on schedule and then on demand and then it's we've got program I've got something like 20 programs running this way so it can be customized be able to use all kinds of different standards but I've got it so that it's it's running this way now. Um, cons, it does say there's false positive and negatives, but really I'm not seeing very many. Um, it does depend on the type of, t of the tool. Um, you have a learning curve. It did, I have been doing it for over 10 years. <laughs> so that's, I mean, I was, I was dumped into it. That was my first job as a as a security 
a cybersecurity person. So that was my first job. So I have been doing it for a while. Um, so if it's, it's also not viable for all budgets. So you might try an open source tool if you can afford like Coverity and Fortify. Luckily, we have a corporate license, so that's why we can do it. But we also had to merge all the data from one server over to my companies and my building, and I am now manager for that server. So that's why <laughs> it's now my job. Um, another secure coding tool is code quality tools. But um, using code quality tools like SonarCube and StyleCop, you can use, you can find code quality tools within your compiler and you can find issues and make your code better quality because even your static code analysis tool will find quality issues. But if you can use Stone, SonarCube and StyleCop to find those issues earlier on, they would make your code better and less issues later on down the road. And they can be used during your manual code review so that if you don't have an automated build, you can still use Center Cube and StyleCop as just the desktop versions. Um, Center Cube has 25 languages. They have they they can find bugs or which are errors that break your code, vulnerabilities. Um, your code's open to attack, and then code smells. Just makes your code more confusing is what it says. Um, looks pretty much like this. Um, that's what I thought was very interesting. It actually can do it for COBOL. Now, how many of us actually still remember COBOL? And um, StyleCop can be set up um, to run during a Visual Studio build, and it can be run automatically from TFS or um, Jenkins. I actually have two programs now that actually run it from Azure, and it can be run through de um, a desktop mode in Visual Studio. It looks like this if you actually have it run through your desktop mode. When you click on one of those issues in the, the previous page, you get the actual error, and it said this is the cause and the rule description. Some of the training that can be found for secure coding include things like the Certified Secure Software Lifecycle Professional, which is my next cert. I've actually been studying for that. The SEI Cert Secure Coding in Java Professional, SEI Secure Coding in Java, the SANS Develop Defending Web Applications, the SEI Secure Coding in C and C++, which I said that was the one that they came out and did the, the boot camp at our building, and then the SEI Cert and Secure Coding in C and C++ Professional Cert. That was the other one that I already have. And then there's this game. This is an amazing game by Secure Code Warrior. And it it was so much fun. I had it was it was just a blast. Um, you actually go in and you actually have to go and find the problem that they are talking about in each of the different languages. And each each threat is a different language. So you want you might have Java, Ruby, um, C sharp, .NET, you might have each one was different. Um, I am I had a 15 day trial that I played with and but since I'm pre presenting at four different conferences, I didn't get much time to play with it. But it was an amazing game to play. So I really recommend this Secure Code Warrior it was um, it was amazing. So um, again, this is the the checklist that I mentioned, um, and some of the the secure coding standard. 
some of the other trainings. And there's Hack EDU. That's the, the training that I just showed you. But that's it. So if you have any questions. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Um, I really appreciate that talk, Mary Ann. And thank you to our sponsors. We're going to be going to a lunch break. Um, and that was really excellent. Thank you.